Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. Cindy Wong, a fourth year pathology resident. And today I would like to do a video where I explain step-by-step -step what it takes to become a pathologist. A lot of these steps will be similar to if you are going into some other subspecialty of medicine. So this also applies if you're a pre-med interesting or a med student who is interested in becoming an internal medicine doctor to some degree. All right, so all journey into medicine starts starts with four years of undergrad. Um, if you're lucky enough to get into those combined undergrad med school programs, which is seven years, you have three years of undergrad, but most people do the traditional four years of undergrad. So during your four years of college, uh, you have to fulfill the uh, pre-med prerequisites before you go apply to med school and they change every now and then. So before you apply, please make sure with the med school that you're applying to, because not all of them have the same prerequisites I've noticed when I was applying. So just make sure that you'll meet all the prerequisites needed to go to or to apply for med school. So after your four years of uh, college, you will be applying to med schools by first taking your MCATs and applying through the MCAS system. The MCAS system is a common application system where it kind of makes your life easier. You're able to fill out one common application and send it to all the med schools that you're interested in and that saves you a lot of time and energy. The one key thing about the application process is you want to apply as soon as the MCAS opens within a week or two of its uh, first opening date because uh, most interviews are given out on a rolling basis. It doesn't, they don't wait for all of the uh, applications to come in before they send out interviews. They will basic med schools will start sending out interviews once they start receiving applications and the people who apply really early on will be more likely to get an interview than someone who applies really late in the process. That is one of the key things you could boost your chances in getting to med school is applying early. When you apply, you'll be sending out your common application and after your common application, your med schools will send you their secondary applications, which are basically more specific essays given to the specific med school you're applying to. But after that, they'll send you interviews, you'll go on your interviews and everyone will know come March what med schools they have been accepted to and they, everyone has uh, time to decide which med school they want to go to and they must uh, submit their final yes to only one med school by May. Now you're in med school. Med school is another four years. Your first two years of med school is your basic science courses. At the very end of your two years of uh, basic science courses, you'll be uh, taking step one, which is one of three tests that you must pass to become a doctor. So step one is a uh, very basic science focus. It's basically all of the uh, biochemistry and the biology and physiology and anatomy and pathology you've learned within your first two years. Um, and that is what people take usually towards the end of their second year. A lot of places do give their med students at least one month off of any classes to hardcore study for step one. And some med schools, I think, uh, give up to like two or three months, which is kind of ridiculous. I, I, I can't even imagine staying focused enough to study hardcore for that long. But that said, I think according to uh, in, uh, the NBME website, starting um, next year, they're gonna change the step one system from number scoring to pass fail, which I think it takes the stress away from that test because I feel like if you ask a lot of med students what was one of the hardest things in med school, they'll probably say step one, but that's, uh, that's now becoming pass fail. Oh, I forgot to mention, a lot of med schools are also becoming pass fail instead of giving you um, a grade in terms of like fail, um, I was a pass, uh, high pass honors, that system, which is basically like saying A, B, C, and D kind of thing. So a lot of med schools are now also pushing towards having their uh, overall courses be pass fail to uh, alleviate the, the stress on their med students. So that is your first two years. And in your third year is when you do your clerkships. And this kind of goes into the beginning of your fourth years as well as you go through the main clerkships of uh, the substance specialties within medicine, you'll realize if you 
like as a specialty or if um, that is something you're interested in pursuing for residency. And during this time, uh, you'll be, you know, touching your toes into internal medicine and general surgery, neurology, emergency medicine, stuff like that. Uh, but if you're interested in pursuing a career in pathology, I would definitely suggest in your third year to take a short rotation in pathology just so you could have your foot through the door. Because when it comes to application season for applying for residency, you're already going to need recommendation letters. And it's hard to get recommendation letters in pathology if you don't do any pathology rotations. And that said, when you go into fourth year, I strongly recommend that you do a full one month elective rotation in pathology. Other things I will also recommend is that if there is a pathology residency program that you really, really want to go to, I would recommend that you do an away rotation. Um, I know in, in this last year, because of COVID, that doing over, away rotations was probably impossible. But hopefully in this next, um, this upcoming uh, fall and the years to come, that doing away rotations is okay. And I think it's a very beneficial experience to see how other pathology programs operate because not every program is similar. And it also puts your foot in the door with the pathology program that you're interested in applying for residency because they will see how you are as a person and you know they can see that you're dedicated and you're hardworking. And that will put you one leg higher when it comes time to apply for residency. So in addition to doing all your clerkship rotations, you will still have to take tests in your third and fourth years which are the shelf exams which comes after every specific rotation you go so for example if you just finish your internal medicine rotation or your family medicine rotation you will have a shelf exam that covers the basic concepts of uh, your rotation and this contributes to in most to my experience these shelf exams contribute a lot towards your overall grade in that clerkship among all of those tests as if it's not already hard enough to be in the hospital working hard as a med student you have to come home and study for those shelf exams but in your um, transition between your third year and your fourth year that summertime that is also when most people take step two. And step two used to be two parts, step two CK and step two CS. Um, step two uh, CK is basically the medical version of step one. So instead of basic sciences, they test you on your medical knowledge in terms of how to treat patients, how to manage patients and diseases, etc. The step two CS portion, which I think has officially as of this year been discontinued, it's, it was a huge, huge money waster and a, really annoying because they only offer in certain cities in the US. Now that it's gone, I'm almost so jealous of um, med students now who do not have to take this exam. So after taking your step two, uh, you'll start applying for your residency, which is the ERAS system. And the ERAS system, again, thank goodness, is a common application. So you only have to do one application and you send it to all the programs that you want to uh, within um, pathology or whatever subspecialty of medicine you would prefer to go into. Oh, So for pathology, I was told that as a med student, you should always apply to at least 30 programs. It doesn't matter what subspecialty you're going into. So I did. Given the advice from my med school, I applied to 30 programs. Oh my gosh. Pathology isn't the most competitive um, residency. I would say that if you are a US, U.S. applicant who really have a decent scores and decent grades, that you probably really only need to do, um, say, 15-ish. Uh, when I talk to all of my other residents, most of them really only apply to like 10 to 15 places. Whereas I was the crazy one who applied to 30, I end up having, uh, I think like 26 interview offers and I went on to like 22 of them. And oh my goodness, I was tired. <laughs> that said, you want to try to go on as many interviews as you can slash financially able to slash 
mentally capable of. Um, the interview trail is long and there's a lot of flying and there's a lot of, um, you know, hotels and stuff like that. So it is a very costly thing. My advice to people who are getting ready to apply for a residency is that um, to take out a little extra in loans for your fourth year because um, I think when I applied, I ended up spending about an extra $5,000 on the interview trail and um, yeah, that was a burden. So in terms of going to interviews, the safest thing is to go on all the interviews you are given because if you don't interview at a place, you'll have no chance of being accepted. But as a person, you are probably only able to withstand interviewing, say, at, you know, no more than 10, 15 places, really, before you're just sick of it. In terms of uh, interviews, I do have some advice. If you're applying for pathology, things not to say on your pathology interview. So don't say, for example, oh, I am going to pathology because it has, um, chill hours and I don't have to work as hard. Um, another thing to not say on an interview would be, oh, I'm going to pathology because I don't have to interact with patients. So things that you should say about why you like pathology would be, for example, um, I really enjoy looking at the slide underneath the microscope because looking at the structures and the dye and the stain, it's so pretty. Um, I know that's something really superficial, but as pathologists, we really like that because we also think all of that's very pretty. Um, if you want inspiration about uh, things that you could say about why you enjoy pathology, please look at my previous videos about what a pathologist is and also about uh, pathology residency, what is it like? And hopefully that will help you with inspirations on your interview trail. Okay, so now that you've interviewed at places, um, you're now approaching the match system. So the match system is where you make a list of places that you would like to go for residency at places that you've interviewed at. And it is then where the programs make a list of all of the applicants they interviewed that they want to come to their program. So when I say when you make this list, you could only rank the places you interviewed at. So for example, if you got 20 interviews, but you only went to 15 of them, you can only rank one through 15. That said, sometimes it's beneficial not to rank all 15 programs because if you end up going on an interview and you went to a program that is a little more malignant, whereas you saw that the um, attending and the resident dynamic wasn't something you enjoyed, also the resident resident dynamic wasn't right, with you, then maybe it's better to say that you don't want to rank that program whatsoever because if you end up going there, you will be extremely unhappy. So it might be worthwhile for you to only rank one through 14. Um, that's something you have to weigh uh, out for yourself. I personally will not recommend you ranking a program that you absolutely hated. That said, what to look for a program that you think you should rank highly. I feel like most pathology residency programs will give you the same or similar education. Places that I think you should rank highly is uh, places that you know you enjoy the interactions you had. For example, you enjoy interacting with all the attendings that interviewed you. You also enjoy all the residents that you interacted with. And then you also get to see um, that the interactions between the current residents there and the attendings are great and the residents are all you know friendly with each other. For for example, I picked my program because when I did my away, away rotation, I felt like um, it just had such a nice and relaxing atmosphere. Um, even though the attendings here are prestigious, they all are very down to earth and the residents, uh, they're always there for each other. And they're not just coworkers, they're also friends. They were able to have fun with each other outside of work or even while they're at work, you know, there's normal chit chat about everyday stuff or, you know, people will go do group outings together, have dinners together. Um, and I think one really important thing was when one resident needed coverage, another resident will gladly offer to um, cross cover for them. So if something comes up in life and you can't do your responsibility for that one day, you don't ever feel like, oh my God, 
what am I going to do? Because you always have support from your peers. So I think that's one of the biggest things to look for when you're applying for a residency program. And I think a lot of my co-residents say the similar things when they were asked by their, um, when they're asked by applicants applicants during the whole process. So that said, uh, the match system, I think is pretty fair and a place towards the applicant in the sense that um, the match system always looks at the applicants pick and of the ranking first before looking at the program's ranking. So for example, if you decided that you want to rank this program number one, and that program also decides to rank you within their spots to rank, then you're automatically accepted. When I say spots to rank, I mean, for example, every program has a certain number of open spots. So for example, if a program has uh, eight open spots and you are ranked in that program within the top eight and you rank that program number one, so the match system will look at you and look at their choice even if you're number eight you're guaranteed a position at that program so yeah that's a very very basic understanding of how the match system works there are int uh, intricacies that you know it will take too long to uh for me to explain but i really think it's a fair system so come middle of march you'll know where you're going and everyone gets excited i know the match was very exciting for me uh, because I matched number one. And I know that now that I'm in my program, come match day, it's also very exciting for the current faculty and residents because they'll get to know who is the new people they get to work with the following year. So come July 1st, well, technically a little before July 1st, most programs have their orientation come middle of June. So come middle of June, uh, you will now no longer be a med student. You are now a full-blown doctor with an MD since you graduated from med school and you will now be part of that hospital working as a doctor. Even though you are technically doctor in training, you are a doctor. In terms of pathology in residency, there is um, two paths well, three paths to go, but I have explained in detail about the different subdivisions of pathology in another video. So please watch that if you want a more in-depth uh, understanding of this. But to become a pathologist for pathology residency, you either do three years of residency or you do four years of residency. If you do three years, you will only be studying or being trained in half of pathology, either the anatomical pathology side or the clinical pathology side. And if you're doing four years, then you're being trained in all of pathology. That's something you actually have to decide when you're applying for uh, residency um, because that is part of the applications process for pathology. And now you're here in residency, usually first half year of residency for pathology is extraordinarily hard because uh, unlike other uh, residencies, say for internal medicine or family medicine or surgery or whatever, as a med student, you are very involved in your clerkships. Whereas in pathology, there's no such thing. There's, you know, generally pathology rotations where as a med student, you kind of just have a shadowing role. So when you come become a resident, it has such a steep learning curve. So as a first year, attendings and your seniors do realize that you have very, very no little knowledge to start with. And as a first year, the expectations for pathology resident would be if you can have just a gut feeling, know if that thing is probably benign or if that thing is malignant and all the other skills you'll learn as you do. Now back to that step test, right? I did mention that there was three step tests and so far you've only taken two. And usually most people in pathology take step three in the first half of first year because you're still sort of in the whole medical mindset because you've just finished your clinical clerkships in med school so you're more prepared to take the test overall um that said for pathology step three doesn't really mean a whole lot you really just need to pass you don't need a high score it is absolutely of no use when applying for fellowships and forever in the future so that's why people just like take it as soon as you can before all of that medical knowledge slips out of your head and forever gone um, so that is you take step three in your first year of residency and then you'll continue on with your three or four years of residency and then most people will continue with their education and do a fellowship. 
And for example, if you are doing a four year program, you will be applying for your fellowship at the beginning of your third year. And that means if you're doing a three year program, you will be applying to fellowship at the beginning of your second year. That sounds intimidating, right? Because that means you need to get enough under your belt to be able to have good recommendation letters and maybe a research project or two before you apply for fellowship and you've only done half of your training or even less if you're doing a three-year program. So pathology fellowships, unfortunately, it has no match or common application. So when you're applying for pathology fellowship, you are applying it as first come first serve. Um, most pathology res uh, fellowship program will open their um, application, I think probably say July, beginning of July of your um, third year, i.e. your very first month of your third year, the applications will be open and you submit your application individually to every program you want to go to for fellowship. And you have to write, um, make sure you have um, your CV updated, you want to make sure you've done some sort of research projects, or you want to have good recommendation letters. You Most places want at least three recommendation letters. So when I apply for my GI fellowship, I had uh, two letters from my GI attending, one letter from kind of the chair of the department, and then I had one letter from my PD, uh, which is the program director. I had to have a cover letter, which is sort of like a, unfortunately, another essay about why you want to do GI pathology. And then, so basically that's it. You want your CV updated, you need your letters and you need to have your uh, cover letter and then you need to apply to fill out the application process. Unfortunately, because it is not a match, it is first come, first serve. The programs will start looking at applications, they'll start sending out interview invites and they'll invite you and you'll accept it. And if you interview and they liked you, most of the time within a week or two, they'll let you know if you've been accepted to the program or not. And you have to usually, been, you're only given one week of decision time, be like, well, you need to let me know if you want to come to my program or not for fellowship. If you were lucky like me, the first place I interview at turns out to be my dream place. Even though I haven't interviewed at other places, I was so blown away that I was like, yep, this is where I want to go. So I got lucky. Unfortunately, there has been instances where people couldn't get the interview from the place they really wanted to go in time for them to make a decision. And they were either forced to take a fellowship position that they didn't really want or they had to risk rejecting that offer and waiting to hope they get another acceptance. And honestly, sometimes there might not be a second acceptance letter to you. So that person's now out of luck and they don't have a fellowship. So this is why I'm saying the match system is fair. The match system is great. I wish pathology fellowships had a match system. A lot of subspecialty do, like for example, anesthesia, internal medicine, those fellowships have a match system. So now that you have matched to a fellowship, you have two years left of your pathology training. And once you're done with your pathology training, you have to sit and study for the pathology boards. <sighs> which is what I'm doing right now. It's very stressful. The pathology boards are broken into two parts, uh, the AP pathology boards and the CP pathology boards. If you are only trained on one half, you just take the one. If you're AP CP trained for your graduate, then you will be taking both portions of the exam. And only once you pass that exam, can you say, I am a board certified pathologist. And then you will do your fellowship. And after your one or two fellowships, sometimes people do two fellowships, they will then during their uh, beginning of their fellowship, that is when people start applying for jobs. Oh man, after all of these years, you're now applying for a job to be a full blown independent doctor. Um, well, let's see how many years was that. So for example, it was four years of undergrad, four years of med school, four years of residency and one year of fellowship and and that turns out to be 13 more years of education after your well high school training 
Yay! So in terms of job application, I really can't say much about this because I'm not at that stage yet. What I can say for about a pathologist with a job is that the entry level average pathologist makes about $170,000 and the average for someone who has worked for 10 years is about $300,000. That said, that's not all pathologists. A lot of pathology jobs are divided into the subcategory of academic, which means you work for a large um, in a medical university hospital that teaches residents and has a med school associated and so on and so forth versus non-academics, which is like your private practice, community hospital. The people who work in the academic setting always make less than the people who are working in the non-academic setting. So when I say in 10 years of working experience, the average salary is $300,000, that is probably closer to the people who are working in a non-academic setting uh, versus people who are working in academics. I have to say for pathology, the compensation for the amount of time we work is pretty good. So that is the official step-by-step -step detailed path to become a pathologist. Please let me know if you have any more questions. And as always, please like and subscribe and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.